Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome to the DBA Fundamentals Virtual Chapter. Today is uh, December 4th and we have a wonderful presentation in store for you. Data Compression 101 with Jess Promfred. Uh, I'll be turning over things over to her in a moment, but a little housekeeping at first. My name is Glenda Gable and I am one of the organizers of the virtual chapter. You can see all of our names there, Steve, Shane, Kevin, and myself. And we all kind of take turns, so you'll get to hear all of us at some point in time. <laughs> um, in order to get a hold of us, if you have um, any questions or whatever, you can email us. And I have our contact information in just a few moments, but DBA fundam Fundamentals at sequelpass.org is our email. Or you can get us on Twitter at DBA Fun. First, I want to thank our sponsors. Our primary sponsor is Century One. They have multiple products to offer with help in development, testing, documenting, and monitoring. You can also download something they have called Plan Explorer for free. It's great for looking at execution plans. Another thing you can do is online, you can actually look and get some uh, free query tuning advice at answers.sequelperformance.com. Another sponsor we have is DB Watch. And as soon as the lag stops, it, okay, there we go. <laughs> it, um, their products actually integrate all aspects of database management into one solution. So it includes managing performance, availability, licensing, optimizing resources, reporting, planning, security, status, and uptime monitoring. I feel like saying, oh my, at the end of all that. <laughs> Definitely check them out. Their, their product is great as well. We like saying thanks because honestly, without them, we couldn't bring you guys as much great and amazing content as we can. Our uh, virtual chapter news. Uh, again, there's our uh, contact information. Uh, all four of us as uh, organizers, you can reach us at, uh, on Twitter and such. We have a main Twitter that you can follow us on for the DBA Fundamentals, and that's at DBA Fun. We make sure we tweet about the session, during the session, upcoming stuff. Uh, we have a Fundamentals Friday kind of thing where we post one of our YouTube um, channels from um, sessions past and things like that. Speaking of YouTube, we also have a YouTube channel, dbafuntube.org. We actually have a collection of sessions of the last four years. It's amazing. And lastly, you can actually uh, check us out on the Slack as well. It's a whole SQL community, just like in Twitter as well. So it's it's awesome. A lot of people are in there. Upcoming SQL Saturdays. Uh, if you're in the Washington, D.C. area or uh, planning on being there, uh, December 8th. Also Nashville, January 12th. I know that there are a lot that are starting to get scheduled for 2019. So check out SQLSaturday.com to register for another event near you. They're an awesome way of getting free training and, and information and networking as well. PASS has a lot of virtual groups. And I just kind of show this for a moment just to let you see that there are a lot on multiple topics. So check out PASS.org and really check out the virtual chapters. And just like this, they'll actually have plenty of uh, free content and sessions and wonderful speakers. These are some of the upcoming sessions for all of them. Um, again, ours with our wonderful speaker, Jess, which you'll hear in just a moment. The Women in Technology, Business Intelligence, Data Architecture, I mean, the, the list goes on and on. These sessions are recorded, and you will be able to see them on the uh, dbafuntube.org, our YouTube channel, in just a few days. With that, I can't think of anything else, so let's turn it over to Jess. All right, let me make you presenter. I see your screen. Wonderful. Do you see the uh, uh, slides or the? Uh, no, I see the virtual machine with the uh, with the management studio. That's what I'm looking at. Sure. Same thing. How do I get the option of which screen to chair? It came up the first time, but it did not come up that time. Oh, here um, we go. Oh. How about now? Nope, still see management studio. <laughs> yeah, that's what we want. We want management studio. OK, OK. Now you see slides? Yes, yes. All right, great. All right, sorry about that, guys. 
Okay, uh, thanks, Linda. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, we're going to talk about data compression today. Uh, a little bit about me. My name is Jess Pomfret. I'm a SQL Server DBA at uh, Westfield Insurance in Ohio. Uh, I've been there about three years, and before that, I worked at another local company doing similar uh, SQL Server work. I am a DBA Tools and DBA Checks contributor. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. I'm uh, passionate about SQL Server, PowerShell, and proper football. Uh, the one with uh, your feet in the ball rather than the hand in the egg. But I live in America at the moment, so uh, there's often some confusion. Uh, I've got my email address and my Twitter handle on the slide. Uh, if you've got any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, I'll also try and be on the Slack channel a bit later on and uh, see if there are any questions on there. So I uh, originally I'm from the southwest of England. I moved to Ohio in 2005 to play football at the University of Akron, and I've stuck around in this area ever since. So my accent is somewhere between these two points. I'll do my best to pronounce my T's, but I uh, picked a career with uh, data where I'm not very, uh, it's not very useful that I can't say my T's, so. All right, so what are we gonna talk about today? Uh, we are gonna go through uh, the advantages and disadvantages of data compression, uh, what we can compress, the types of compression we can use, uh, what we should compress, how we can compress, some performance implications, and then we're going to touch on a little wizardry. So as you can see from this uh, chart, data compression has been around since SQL Server 2008. So why is it important now? Well, ever since SQL Server 2016 SP1, it became a standard edition feature. Uh, before that point, it was enterprise only, so it kind of had that uh, price barrier to get in to, uh, to that enterprise licensing and be able to use that on your machine. So since SQL Server 2016, uh, SP1, we've got more options to use this. Now it is also supported in SQL Server 2019. This function's not going anywhere. There was one addition in SQL Server 2019. Don't get your hopes up, it's not very exciting. We'll cover it a bit later on. Uh, as you can see, this uh, data compression is also supported in the uh, Azure offerings. So the advantages of data compression. Obviously, the first one is we're reducing our database size. This is going to reduce the amount of space we need on disk to store our database. There's cost savings associated with that. More importantly is the second point. We are going to fit more data per page. And as SQL Server reads data from the, uh, from the disk into memory, it does it at, at the page level. So the more data you can fit per page, the less I.O. we need to do. We're going to see a significant improvement in performance for I.O. intensive workloads. Because of, uh, because of that additional data per page, we're going to fit uh, more in memory. Now, the flip side of that is the is the cost of compressing and decompressing data, which is CPU cost. Uh, we're going to see slightly slower inserts and updates, and then slower again bulk inserts and updates. Uh, Microsoft had a white paper right around when data compression came out in 2008 uh, edition, and uh, they said it was about 10% overhead of CPU for row compression. Uh, so not a major disadvantage there. Uh, quite often the I.O. gains you see kind of uh, balance off that CPU cost and we'll look into these performance implications later on. So the other disadvantage of data compression is, is an enterprise level feature. Now I did just tell you it was a standard edition level, standard level feature, uh, but before 2016 SP1 it was enterprise edition. So this is just one thing to keep in mind. If we have a production enterprise uh, SQL server and we want to take our nice production database, back it up, restore it to our test system, which is only running standard. I don't know who would do that. Just saying, just if you, if you feel like it. You're going to spend however long it takes to restore that database. And at the last second, it's going to fail because you cannot restore uh, enterprise level features to a standard edition instance. Now, SQL Server, it would be nice if it told you that before it spent five hours restoring, but it will wait to the last minute when it tries to bring it online. Okay, so what can we compress? We can compress entire tables, either the heap or the clustered index. Uh, we can compress non-clustered indexes. We can compress indexed views or individual partitions of tables. Uh, the individual partitions is useful because if you have a large table and uh, your current partition, maybe it's partitioned by date, your current month is pretty active, you don't really want to take the performance hit of compressing that partition, you could compress your older partitions, which are only used for maybe reporting or occasional use. 
Uh, so you'll see the space savings of compressing most of your table while keeping your active partition performant. Uh, one other thing to note here is non-clustered indexes. If you create a non-clustered index on a compressed table, it will not inherit that compression level. Uh, unless you specify in the create index statement, it will be uh, not compressed. So what can't be compressed? Uh, system tables, memory optimized tables, or tables with sparse columns cannot be compressed. Uh, the other thing that can't be compressed is if your uh, if your row plus the compression overhead exceeds the maximum row size of 80, 60 bytes. Uh, SQL Server will do this uh, row size check when you uh, first compress your object, and then again whenever rows are inserted, update it to make sure that this uh, this rule is not broken. Uh, first of all, any update to fixed length columns must always succeed. You also must be able to disable data compression successfully. So, if your compressed row fits within that row size guide, but you're but uncompressing it does not, it will not allow you to do that operation. So, our compression types. Uh, we have row and page compression. Those are our row store compression technologies. That's what we're going to cover today. Uh, we also have column store and com column store archival uh, compression. Those came out in SQL Server 2012. Uh, we're not going to talk about them today, just know that they're around. Uh, we also have backup compression, which also came out in 2008 and is compressing your backup on, on the disk. Uh, not going to cover that today, just making you aware that there are other compression options. Okay, so row compression. Uh, this is the first option we have when we talk about row store compression. This is going to change the actual uh, physical storage of the data. It is going to take fixed length data types and store them in variable length columns. Uh, you can see on the slide I have a few examples. If we have uh, small int, int, or big int, we're going to only use the bytes needed for the values in that column. So if our column has perhaps the number one in it, we don't, and it's in a big int, we don't need the eight bytes uh, of storage for that big int. We can store it in just one byte and free up the other seven. Uh, for character fields, any trailing spaces will be removed. These are fixed length character fields. We're basically changing them to variable length and, and trimming off that trailing space. Uh, one opposite effect on data types is if you look at the bit data type, our SQL Server actually optimizes how it stores bits and it stores and so compressing them, adding that metadata overhead of compression actually increases the size of bits. There are a couple of other data types that we'll see in a second uh, where compression actually has negative effects, but most of the time uh, for row compression, we're gonna see some gains. All right, so I have this example table for you. It's my employee table, it's a, a local business. Uh, you can see there's some repeating data in here. And my database designer was not a fan of variable length columns. They've got big int for our ID, and then we've got some fixed character fields uh, for our other columns. As you can see, there's a lot of white space on this page. Now, granted, this is not how SQL Server stores data. This is an Excel spreadsheet, uh, but it kind of gets the uh, point across that there is a lot of white space, a lot of wasted space on this page that we could use for other things. So let's apply row compression. Remember, that's just changing the physical storage. We're not changing any data. When we apply, we're when we apply row compression, you can see we just take out that white space. Now, again, it's important to remember this is not how it's stored on the page, but this is a good representation of how we can compress that table down and, and get some space back. All right, our next option for compression is page compression. So the first, uh, there are three stages of this. This all happens in the engine. We just say page compress and it does this. The first step is row compression, what we just saw, uh, removing the white space, uh, changing it to variable length columns. There are then two more stages. Uh, we have prefix compression and dictionary compression. Uh, both these uh, techniques are gonna look at duplicate data and, and replacing that duplicate data with pointers. So let's take a look at those. Here's my table again. The first stage of page compression, as we know, is row compression. We've taken out that white space. Uh, this is as small as it would be if we just row compressed it. Since we specified page compression, we're going to apply step two, uh, which is prefix compression. Now, prefix compression is going to look for, in each column on a page, it's going to look for a uh, repeating beginning of the column. So you can see in my first name, I have Alex and Alexis. 
Obviously, Alexis is the larger of the two values, so it's stored uh, in what is called an anchor record uh, just after my page header on the page. We're then going to point back to that and use that in our first name column on this page. So Alex is replaced with the number four, which means use the first four characters. And uh, on row three, we have it empty because we're using Alexis. Same for Young. You can see that that is taken out, stored in the uh, in the anchor record, and then we've just pointed back to it. So this is step two. We've taken out the, the white space. We've applied prefix compression. The third and final stage uh, step of page compression is dictionary compression. This is the same thing uh, uh, as we just saw, where we're taking out repeating data. We're storing it in the compression information section of the page, and then we're pointing back to it. The difference here is that the dictionary compression can be anywhere on the page. Uh, it's not specified for one column. So the, the first uh, prefix compression we saw was column specific. This is anywhere on the page. Uh, it's also important to note that this is not type. Uh, it's not dependent on type. If you have repeating data in different data types, uh, those can be replaced also. All right, so let me show you what I'm talking about here. All right, I have my management studio. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, I have just a simple database here, compressed test, and I'm going to create a table named employee and insert those three rows. I'm then going to use this command dbcc in to uh, pass in the database name, the table name, and option one. It is going to show me the pages uh, that, this that this employee table is using. Now over here, you can see I've got two types. Uh, page 10 is a, a page type of 10 is a index mapping page. Uh, what I'm interested in is this. Uh, page one. So you can see the page ID is 456. This is where the actual data is stored on the page. So I'm going to come down here and use dbcc page. I'm going to pass in 456. Now this trace flag is just going to change where the, the output of this command goes. Usually it goes to the event log. I want it to come to my messages so I can show you. Now I'm going to scroll down. Here's the page header that we mentioned earlier. And for this uh, demo, we're going to look at this column or this row of data right here. The P min length of 512, that's the size of fixed length records on the page. Uh, as I said in our example, we had a lot of uh, fixed type, da fixed data types, so that's expected. Our slot count is the number of records. We have three. And then our free count, we have 6,545 bytes free space on the page right now. Now, if I scroll down further, you can actually see the data on the page. Here's my first record, Alex Young. You can see all this white space. This is because we have those fixed, uh, fixed length columns. If I continue scrolling down, you'll see the other records, but I just wanted to show you that first one. So I'm going to apply row compression to the table. I'm going to re rebuild all the partitions with that row compression. Now, when we row compress or when we compress a tool, it actually writes it to a new page. So I'm going to run dbcc end again. I'm looking for page type one. We're on page 464, so I'm going to pass that in here. Check out our results again. If I come on down here, we'll find the row we're looking at. You can now see my min length is five. That was 512 before. Uh, so you, as you can see, we've uh, redesigned how we're storing that data. It's now variable length instead of fixed length. Uh, you can see we've still got three records. There's no magic going on. Well, there's no trickery. Uh, and you can see there's 7,971 free bytes on the, on the page. So we've increased our free space on the page as expected. Now, if we come down here, you can see our data. We've now got no white space between this. We've compressed, compressed those data types down and removed all of that white space that we had before. OK, last step, let's try page compression. Same command, I've just changed my data compression uh, to page. Again, it's rewritten that page, so let me grab the page number. Our data type, page type of one for our data page, we're now on page 472. Let's take a look at our page. All right, we come down here, our fixed length is five. Uh, since we've already applied row compression and row compression is the first step of page compression, that would be uh, our fixed length uh, data types now. We've got three records and we've got 7971 bytes of free space on the page. That hasn't changed. I just told it to page compress and I just told you we were going to take out this repeating data and we were going to save more space. 
If I come down here, I'm not seeing anything different. I still see the data. Let me just prove to you that it's page compressed. I just have a command here that's looking at the system tables. Tables. Here's my table name, my clustered index. We're showing that it's page compressed. So like every good DBA, SQL Server is a tiny bit lazy. It doesn't get anything from page compressing this particular page because there's only three rows on it. So as I insert uh, 200 rows into that table, at some point it spills onto the next page and it realizes that it can, there's a benefit from page compressing that page. That's when the page compression happens. So if I look now, I've got four pages associated with my object. I still have 472, which is our first data page. I'm gonna pop that into here. And we'll have a look at this uh, page header again. You can see I still, we've got fixed length fields of five characters. We've now got 102 records and our free space is 3496. If we come down to just directly after the header on the page, we have our compression information section. This is uh, special to page compression, so we know it's page compressed now. And if we come down here, we can see some of the values that we would expect to have been pulled out. Here's Alex, here's Young. These are now able to be pointed back to in the compression information. We don't need to store those anymore on the page. We just point back to them. So if I come down here to my first, record these are all uh metadata about the dictionary so here's my first record before this said alex young to san run now alex and young have been replaced they're now in the dictionary and we're just pointing back to them and we can tell that right here these symbols are the pointers back to that dictionary this long value right here is to san run the address that obviously didn't repeat anywhere else on the page and so was not uh taken out uh, there was no benefit to that, so. All right, so that's what compression looks like on the page. Let's pop back to my to my slides. I put the the commands in the slides if you want to play around with them. It's it's kind of interesting to see like how it changes. Uh, and there's some good blog posts out there that I can link to uh, from my downloads also on on more information. Okay. So we've talked about what you can compress and the different types of compression we can we can use, but what should we compress? Now, numeric or fixed length columns where there are a lot where the, the values don't use all the allocated bytes, uh, that creates a lot of that free space. So when we row compress or page compress, we get a lot of benefit from that. Also any nullable columns with a lot of null values uh, and any repeating data values. That sh we showed that example of using the dictionary, it pulls out those repeating data. Uh, so that, that's a good candidate for compression. The other thing to think about is our workload. Uh, if we have a low percentage of updates or a high percentage of scans, those tables or those indexes are good for page compression. The reason for that is if we think about scans, if we're going to scan a whole object, we're going to read every page into memory. If we have less pages because we've page compressed, that IO is going to be reduced and we're going to see a performance, a performance improvement. Okay, so that's fine, but how do we work out what we should compress? So there are a couple of ways. Uh, the first is this SP estimate data compression saving stored procedure. Now, this is where the SQL Server 2019 new feature is. I told you not to get excited. You can now use that stored procedure to uh, estimate column store and column store archival compression savings. Previously, you could only use row, uh, row page or none. Uh, so that's the only change to data compression in SQL Server 2019. Uh, this store procedure you can use on your on-premise uh, instances. After I gave this presentation at our user group, group in Cleveland, uh, Aaron uh, actually tweeted out that uh, it, it doesn't work in Azure. You can't use this, uh, this procedure in Azure. You can use data compression, but you can't estimate your savings. Uh, so Kaylin Delaney actually built a store procedure for Azure, so that's out there now. Uh, you can download that and use that if you're using uh, uh, SQL Server in the cloud. So once we, I'm going to show you a couple of demos on on how to use that stored procedure. There's also uh, a stored or a script from the Tiger team, which is SQL Server Engineering, uh, that uses that procedure and takes into consideration your index stats to work out which tables should have which level of compression. So that's really a, a good way of comparing your whole database. And we'll look at how we can apply compression. 
All right, so I'm using an AdventureWorks database here. Uh, I am going to run this for uh, two scenarios. So we're passing in the schema, the table name. You can pass in index and partition uh, details if you want to be more sp specific. And then you pass in your compression option. Like I said, you can pass in row, none, or page. Uh, in 2019, you'll be able to pass in column store and column store archival. So let me run these two, and we'll see what we get. Okay, so my sales order detail table, I have a clustered index of index ID 1, and then I have two non-clustered indexes, 7 and 8. You can see that currently we're not compressed. Uh, we're almost 10 megs in size. If we apply row compression, this is telling us we will be just under 7 megs in size. The second pane is uh, the same results, but if we use page compression, you can see we'd be just under 5 megs. Uh, so we're going to see about 50% savings by page compressing this table. You can see that uh, this index, index number 7, or ID 7, it's a non-clustered index. It starts off being just under 4 megs, and by the time we apply any compression, be it uh, row or page compression, we've made it larger. Well, that was not the aim of data compression. Uh, I tell you that that is a non-clustered unique index on row grid. Rogue, uh, grids, not great compression candidates. They use all of the available space in the column, and they are also unique. So there's no repeatability. This is not a good candidate for compression. If we were going to compress this table, we can compress the clustered index. We could compress this non-clustered index. As you can see, there's a space saving. I would, I would uh, probably recommend leaving this one with no compression. The other way we can see uh, uh, the compression savings is we can come into Management Studio and we can navigate down to the index. Uh, we can right click on that guy. We can go Storage, Manage Compression. You can do this at the table or the index level. You can click through. It shows we currently have no compression. If we choose Row Compression, calculate that out, it's going to get our current space and our requested space. The interesting thing to note here is it will not do it by index. It has done it for the entire table and all the indexes. So this is a little kind of uh, hard to work out what you would compress. I would recommend using the uh, SP data estimate data compression savings. Okay, so the second thing I want to show you for this is the uh, Tiger Team script. I'm going to run this. It takes a little while to run, but basically it's going to go through my database. It is going to test. Uh, it's going to use SP estimate data compression to test for row and page compression to calculate the savings. It's then also going to look at our index usage to work out uh, with our current workload uh, which one it would recommend. Now, obviously, that is cumulative. Or maybe not obviously, but it is this index that's a cumulative from your last restart. So it's important to remember that uh, when you run this, you want to have had like a, a real workload running. This is just my demo machine, so not much is going on. If I scroll down here, you can see I have my sales order detail. It's pulled back my clustered index and one of my non-clustered indexes. It has estimated the percentage of the original if we use row compression and again if we use page compression. And then it's suggesting uh, that we use page compression. That's its uh, recommendation. So this is a good way of looking through your entire database for any tables or indexes that would benefit from compression. Uh, you can then use that to guide your uh, your decisions on what to compress. Okay, so now we know what we want to compress. Uh, let's look at how we apply it. We saw this uh, SQL in my demo earlier with the pages, but uh, I want to compress sales order detail with row compression. Uh, I can apply it to the table. This would hit just the clustered index. And then to uh, compress that non-clustered index, I'm going to use alter index instead of alter table. Both have this rebuild partition option of all. Uh, my table only has one partition, so it doesn't matter whether I put one or all in there, it's going to do just that one partition. If you wanted to compress just certain partitions, you could pass in numbers here. Here's my data compression option. I'm going to use row. You could put page. If you wanted to remove compression, you'd put none. So let me get rid of this one. All right, so this is the same procedure we saw earlier. It's just showing our uh, my clustered, two non-clusters, our current data compression. We have no data compression. 
All right, so let's apply row compression. It doesn't take very long because this table is pretty small, but if you have large objects, it can take a longer time. Okay, let's confirm. Okay, I've compressed my clustered index and my non-clustered index with row compression. I avoided this GUID because uh, there was no benefit and I didn't want to make it larger. The other way we can apply compression is through Management Studio. Again, we can right click on the table or the index, go to storage, manage compression. We can click through here and I can change this. It's currently row compressed. I can change this to page compression. I can calculate it if I want to. Okay, it's gonna save me some space. Remember, it's calculating this for the whole table, so it's not totally accurate for what I exa exactly what I asked, which was just the, the clustered index, really. Uh, I'm gonna run it immediately. I'm gonna press finish. Okay, so I clicked on the table. I said compress with page. It estimated it for all the objects in the table, but it's important to note that it actually only did the clustered index. I'm, I'm not sure whether that's by design or not, but uh, just something to remember if you're gonna do, if you're gonna apply compression through Management Studio, that that's something to watch out for. All right. Let's hop back to the slides for a second. All right, here's the T-SQL I showed you just to apply compression to the table or the index. It's just for your notes. Okay, compression performance. So we talked about the two main performance impacts here. We've got our CPU increase, increases for compressing and decompressing data as we need to use it. And then we have our disk IO decreases since objects require less pages. We're fitting more data on those pages. So when we read it into memory, we need to read less pages. So let's look if we can demonstrate this. All right. I have a sales order large database that I've just taken that sales order detail and sales order header tables that we were looking at previously and uh, made them larger. There's a Jonathan Cahaya script that you can use to enlarge these. You can see I have my uh, regular table with no compression. I then have a version with page compression and a version with row compression. You can see the amount of page and the, the size in megabytes is uh, significantly lower when we step through the, the compression levels. I'm going to use these to show uh, the performance imp implications of compression. Now, granted, these are still not huge tables, but it, it is good enough to demonstrate uh, this. All right, so first of all, here's a quick lesson for free on T-SQL bad practices. I've written a really bad query here. I've got a function in the where clause, which means it can't use an index even if there was one. I've set it to option max stop one, telling it to only use one CPU. Uh, this is just to keep my test fair. Probably in the in the real world, we want to trust SQL Server that it knows best. Uh, I'm also using free proc cache and drop clean buffers just to remove everything from memory, so everything's kind of a cold test to begin with. And I'm going to turn on uh, set statistics time on and set statistics IO on. It's going to return some. Uh, some measures of my query. So I'll run this one. We're running it first against just the regular table. This table has no compression. If I hop over to my messages tab, I've got a notepad, we can keep track of this. So our CPU time is 1703. Our elapsed time is 2178. If you can see that, it's just been outputted here. And then I'm gonna look at our logical reads uh, for the sales order header table. We got 7913 and for the uh, sales order detail table, we got 73,824. All right. So I'm going to run the same thing against our row compressed table. You can see here I've just uh, appended these tables with a row so we can keep track of which one we're looking at. We'll run that same query. Now, this query isn't taking a significantly long time. Like I said, it's not a great query, but uh, I'm still working with relatively small tables. You can see my CPU time has come down a little here. We're now using row compression. So we've removed all of the free space. We're storing our fixed length columns uh, as variable length, 7272 on the sales order header table, and then 35677 logical reads on the sales order detail table. Now, that's a pretty significant drop just there. All right, let's take a look at final option, which is our page compressed table. You can see the queries. Uh, still not running particularly fast, or like we're not seeing a big difference there, but our CPU time is 1641. Our elapsed time is 1786. And our reads are at 7229. 
and two, four, eight, six, six. I'm going to save that and just hop over to a spreadsheet that I have. Uh, this is just going to pull that data in. It's easier to see it in the spreadsheet rather than the text file, hopefully. All right, so you can see our CPU time or our elapsed time of the query has gone down for sure. Our CPU time has gone down a little bit. Uh, you can see there's not much difference around that on CPU time. However, if you look at our logical reads, this was significantly reduced. So even though we've got that additional CPU use uh, for compressing and decompressing the data, the reduction in logical reads and the basically the I.O. savings is so significant uh, that we're seeing a performance increase. So uh, that's one thing to think about when you're looking to apply compression to your uh, uh, to your database is whether the I.O. stuff is going to uh, kind of counterbalance the CPU costs. All right, so this is great. We now know how we know about the advantages and disadvantages of uh, compression. We know that uh, what we can compress, how we can compress, the types of compression, uh, and what we should compress. So, what happens if we want to compress a whole database? We have that Tiger Team script to show us what we should compress, maybe. Uh, but if we want to compress a whole a whole database, one of our options excuse me, is to build uh, some scripts off of sysobjects. Maybe we could make a nice cursor that just loops through and applies compression. Uh, okay, but what about if we want to compress multiple databases? It's starting to get a little messy. Or even multiple databases across multiple servers. This is the wizardry I was mentioning. Uh, now, as I said, I am a contributor for... I'm a contributor for DBA Tools. Uh, it is an open source PowerShell module hosted on GitHub. And the kind of founder and uh, like mother of DBA tools, uh, Chrissy, says it's kind of like a command line SQL Server Management Studio. Basically, if you can do it in Management Studio, you can probably do it with DBA tools. Uh, we now have over 400 functions. And if you want more information, the link's on the page. Uh, you can also go to that page and it will tell you how to get it installed. If you, if you can install it from the gallery or not, uh, that's the easiest option. Now. I don't know how familiar you are with uh, PowerShell, but I'm going to tell you there are two commands you need to get started with PowerShell and especially DBA tools. Uh, the first one being get command. Get command. So basically, we know we want to use DBA tools. We know we want to do some data compression things. Uh, I'm going to use get command. I'm going to pass in the module of DBA tools and the name compression. Uh, those are wildcards. Uh, so anything with compression in the name, and it returns these three commands or functions. Oh, I've got get compression, set compression, test compression. Now, with any PowerShell commands, get and test, you're pretty safe to run those. It, get is going to retrieve stuff from your system and display it back to you. Test is going to test that against best practices. If you're going to use set, you need to, first of all, understand what it's going to do. And second of all, probably best not to run it in production first off, because that is going to actually change something on your on your system. So just a heads up. But anyway, we can run get command. We've got these commands we want to use. Well, how do we get more information about them? That's my second PowerShell command for you, get help. You use get help, you pass in a, a function that we got from get command, and now we're starting to get more information about what we can use this for. So get dba db compression does pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It gets the tables and index size and the current compression settings from your server. Now you can just pass in a SQL instance and it will give it to you for the whole server, or you can specify a database. And, uh, so let's take a look at DBA tools. All right, so I've already imported my module, but if you were opening a fresh window, you would uh, import your DBA tools module. Uh, if you're able to use the PowerShell gallery, you can do install dash module to get that if you don't have it on your system already. Uh, so if we look at this get dash command module, I proved to you that I've got three compression functions available to me within the DBA tool module. I can then run uh, get dba db compression. I'm using show window that opens it up in a separate window, all of the help available for that command. Now, one of the things Chrissy like prides dba tools on is the fact that all of the functions have this command based help. Uh, she will not accept a submission to the to the module if it does not come fully documented with help and examples. So you can scroll through here. Uh, you can check out the parameters available, some author information, and then you can check out these examples. I could take one of these, uh, 
change the SQL instance and be able to run this and get started pretty quickly. So I recommend you all uh, to check this out and uh, kind of work through it, even if you're not super familiar with PowerShell. All right, so let's have a look at our uh, our compression. So I'm going to run this test DBA DB compression. Uh, I'm running against my local machine, my AdventureWorks database that we've been looking at this whole time, and I'm going to pass it into the results uh, object. Ah, so one of the benefits of PowerShell is this is this concept of using objects. We can keep those results, and I can use them further on in my script. I can kind of investigate them, see what I've got in them, and then uh, do things with them. So uh, as this is running, it takes about 30 seconds. What it's doing is it's applying that Tiger Team script that we saw in Management Studio. It's running it against my database and bringing back the results. So I'm going to have the suggestions, uh, the recommendations the Tiger Team has on whether I should row, page, or no compress my objects. Uh, it's also going to have the index workload. Uh, so that just finished up. What I'm going to do here is take that results object and pipe it. This just moves the uh, contents of results through the pipe into the next part. So I basically got a SQL statement here. I got my where clause whoops, and my select statement, the fields I want to select, and I'm going to run that. So you can see over here, one second, what we were supposed to do was reset this to no compression. I'm going to run this again real quick uh, so that we get the results that we want. So this is going to take about 30 seconds again. Is there uh, any questions right now that uh, we want to handle while this is running? Or So far, so good. If okay. the target team script is built into the test DBA compression function. It is indeed, yes. The test DBA DB compression is basically running that Tiger Team script against uh, the instance and database you specify. Uh, so it's using their best practice recommendations, uh, which is kind of nice because those are probably the people you want to trust. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, wow, everyone's coming in. Uh, what is the editor used for PowerShell script? I think they're asking about your one. The editor? Yeah. It's uh, VS Code, which actually... Uh, I would recommend looking into that also because it's a great uh, editor for PowerShell and other scripts. Uh, and I believe that the uh, new tool for SQL Server, Azure Tools, or I forget what its what its new name is, is also oh, built Azure on top of this. Studio, so. Yeah, Data Studio, exactly. Yep. Cool. And uh, I think we'll leave you off for a second. All right, perfect. Okay, so that's finished up. Uh, let's have a look at my results again. All right, now that looks better. Okay, so I've got my clustered index here and my non-clustered index, they're currently not compressed. I've only selected a few of the columns here, but there is more available in that results object. Uh, you can see that the Tiger team is recommending page compression, which is what we saw previously. So this is great. I now know what the recommendations are for my database. Uh, I've only pulled out the recommendations for sales order detail for, to show you, but there are more in here uh, for all the other objects. The nice thing about this, is I can now use this set DBA DB compression uh, command. I can pipe in those results, or I pass them in as an input object, I'm sorry. And uh, it's actually going to go through and take those recommendations and apply them to my database. You can see this already processed. It's now set these, uh, these objects to be uh, page compressed, any object in the database that it saw there was a recommendation for. So let's take a look at this. Uh, I'm using get DBA DB compression. I'm going to do out grid view, which opens up this window. And when that has finished, the nice thing about out grid view that I really like is you can type in like a filter. So I know I want to look at sales order detail. I can type that in and it'll pull up any that matches. It's actually still running in the background. There it goes. All right. So you can see here's my sales order detail table. There are a few others on the, uh, within the database. And you can see that the data compression here is none for the uh, rogue wood because it did not recommend compressing that. And then page compression for these two. Uh, you can also see that page compression has been uh, applied to some other objects within the database. So the last thing I'll leave you with for DBA tools is if you uh, 
don't necessarily care about the recommendations. Perhaps you have a database on your dev server and you really care about space savings rather than performance. Uh, you can actually use uh, set DBA DB compression to apply a compression type to every object in your database. Now, if I didn't specify the database, it would go through every user database and apply row compression, but it's just tearing through my entire database right now, compressing objects one at a time uh, until they're all row compressed. So this is a great way of saving some space on your development machines, as long as they are uh, either 2016 SP1 higher standard edition or enterprise edition, if you're running an older build than that. Uh, but this is a great way to save some space in your dev environments uh, and a really quick way to apply it with DBA tools. So I got a couple more slides. This is just the code I was running for test and then set DBA DB compression. Uh, my demos will all be uploaded to GitHub if you wanna grab them and, and play around with them a little more but uh, this is the, the two main ones there. So if you're interested in learning more about data compression, uh, Books Online has some great resources. Uh, there is a data compression white paper I mentioned earlier. It is from 2008, but it is still the same technology, so it's still relevant. Uh, the Tiger team has that evaluate compression gain script, and actually that, that's their GitHub link, link. They have some other really cool stuff in that Tiger toolbox, so worth checking that out for sure. Uh, finally, I got a couple of links for DBA tools. Uh, both their website and their GitHub repo. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free. If we've got time, I can field a few questions. Otherwise, uh, feel free to email me or find me on Twitter or in Slack later on. Before he uh, passes on some more questions, I do want to mention, if you guys want me to pass your uh, email address to Jess, please indicate in the questions area that you're good with that. I'm not able to, because of GDPR and all that kind of stuff, um, uh, just automatically pass your email address. So if you're interested um, in, in, in me passing her your email, please indicate in the questions. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, we've got a good one here about what happens with data compression and TDE. Ah, uh, yeah, I actually have that in one of my slide notes. Uh, I skipped over it. Um, so, I, and now I let me find it. One second. Yeah, no worries. Um, while you're searching, I will say that um, this session will be is being recorded and it will be up on dbafundtube.org. Uh, once we get it converted after the session. So Great. don't worry about that. Uh, where did my notes go? Okay, compression and encryption. Uh, so when you compress the data, it's rewritten as unencrypted data and then encrypted. So the recommendation is to compress first and then encrypt. Uh, so you can still get some compression gains with using TDE. Uh, if you use application encryption, uh, you can still compress it, but you won't see uh, the benefits really because that data is uh, is unique as it's passed to SQL Server. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's pretty good. Um, if you have backup compression activated, does that affect positively or negatively on row or page compression, or does it make a difference? Um, so I actually have a blog post about this because I got asked that question when I gave this uh, either in Cleveland or Columbus recently. But um, you actually do get, uh, so backup compression is the data written to uh, compress backup file. And when you have uh, row compression or page compression enabled in your database, you do still get a reduction in size of your backup file. Um, when you don't have it compressed, you get about a 78% reduction uh, when you compress the backup file and it's about 70% for row compression and 60% for page compression. But I can link to that blog post which uh, laid out my tests if if that's helpful. Yeah, that, that, I think that sounds good. I think they'd enjoy that. Uh, <laughs> this is a good one. Just wanted to say as a Westfield Insurance customer, it's good to know they have such a great DB objecting my data. Huh. Oh, thank you. Uh, okay. What's performance impact with a query having some tables with data compression and some tables without compression? And if you join on those uh, two tables. Uh, so the data is actually compressed, uh, it is uncompressed as it's used in the query. So as you need it for the join, it will be uncompressed. Uh, it doesn't matter whether all of your tables are or aren't uh, compressed. You don't, you don't see any negativity if one of your tables is not compressed used in a query. Uh, 
the the mo most important things to look at are whether that particular table would benefit from compression rather than if it's using a query with other compressed tables. Okay. Um, there is a lovely one that I think I was looking for Kevin, but I'm going to steal it now. Sorry, Kevin. Uh, if you're using compression, does that change the allocation unit size that you should use on formatting volumes for SQL data? Uh, I believe not, but I'm not. Uh, I don't want to answer one way or another on that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Um, if, if he wants as well, or the I actually didn't catch the name, we can send out this question to you and you can reply in your own time Perfect. or create a blog yep. post. Yeah. Um, and I think that's it. If I've missed any more, Kevin, please shout it out. But I think that's all the questions so far. Great. All right. I'm actually, I'm actually going to look at the DBA tools and see if I can run compression on my own servers. Wonderful. Yeah, it's, it's pretty uh, it's pretty neat just to be able to run that real quick and see if there are any uh, quick fixes that you can apply. So. Alrighty, again, make sure you guys are checking out dbafuntube.org. That's dbafuntube.org for uh, this recording, which will be up in a couple days, as well as any of our past ones. You can also check out dbafun.org. Um, dbafun.org, which is where our, all of our list of uh, upcoming sessions, and we have the first half of 2019 already filled in. So check out those. On Twitter, you can find us at, at dbafun. And lastly, everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you so much again, Jess. Oh, sure. Thanks for having me. <laughs>
even though I just sit back and listened. <laughs> that Thanks, should be. Did, speaker did great, and everybody else did great. I appreciate it. Thank, thanks for having me again, guys. Oh, yeah. It was wonderful meeting you. Yeah, you too. Take it easy. Bye.